Kinaole is an indigenous word in Hawaii that stands for doing the right thing at the right time, at the right place, for the right reason. And so today we're going to hear from Kinaole Foundation's founder, Mr. Ray Hardeen. Since the time of our interview, Maui's been devastated by the wildfires, and so our hearts and prayers go out to any of the families that were impacted by that. This particular podcast episode today, Mr. Ray Hardeen shares his experiences of how he translated his 33 years of service as a veteran to growing a 400-person firm before selling that off. I had the pleasure, the opportunity to meet him at the last year's Native Hawaiian Organization Conference that I attended, and they introduced me to him. And he said that it would be the last one he attended because he was sent stepping back from his role as a leader in the NHO community. So we had a chance to sit down for about an hour and talk about what that experience was like, how he grew the organization, what were some of the lessons learned. And so I want you to hear from this humble giant, a life of service. And so I want to nominate him when we talk about a life well lived, this is truly a life well lived. And he continued to give back to his community he continues to give back to the nation. And so we appreciate him. We want to honor him and respect him. And so I look forward to hearing back all the great feedback from those who enjoy this upcoming episode. Thank you so much, Mr. Harding, for coming on the GovCon Giants podcast. We appreciate you. We thank you for all of your hard work and your effort. And we look forward to this upcoming episode. Enjoy. Hey, I'm Raymond Jardine, the founder of Ken Oli Foundation, a Native Hawaiian organization. Thank you for that. And so, Ray, you and I met in Hawaii. Tell me, what were you doing there? Well, I actually was born and raised there and um, started my first, when I retired from the Army in 2004, started my first company, uh, Native Hawaiian Veterans, and and then started the uh, NHO in 2018, so when I started the NHO organization, which had five companies underneath it, uh, the nonprofit, and four of the companies, three in San Antonio, one in Guam, and one in Virginia. Okay, nice. And what was the name of the NHO company? There were the foundation. Oh, different companies. names. Yeah. The, Sorry. It's Ken Oli Foundation, and then it has four, five uh, subsidiaries underneath them. Okay, okay. You said that was in 2018? Yes. Okay, okay, all right. Uh, and then also, you were the past president of the NHOA organization. Yes, twice. Twice. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Can you tell people who don't know, who, who are unfamiliar with the organization, what that organization stands for and what they're about? The NHO is a Native Hawaiian organization. It's a, a program started by Senator Inouye back in 2004. That gave Native Hawaiians the same or similar consideration as Alaska Native corporations and tribes uh, in the federal marketplace under the entity, or, and many people call it the Super 8A or um, Indigenous um, programs, so 8A programs. Okay. And so when the time when you start your business, was that in place already or no? Well, when I retired in 2004, that's sort of when I started my first company. Okay. Uh, and that was because of a friend who was a business person. And, you know, I retired and I was trying to figure out something. And he, he asked me to, he says, consider becoming an entrepreneur instead of working for somebody else again. Um, so started that. Um, and it ended up being quite successful. Um, we were at the... Uh, when I sold the company, it, it was doing already about it had about fifty million dollars in backlog of uh, per year for the next four years. So about over two hundred million dollars of work sitting there. We were in fifty states, uh, four territories, and twenty countries. And then I sold, and that's when I started the Native Hawaiian organization called Kinoli Foundation, and we kept building that until. 2018, when I stepped out as the CEO and chairman and handed it over to the next generation. Very well. Nice. So that's interesting. What what line of work did that organization do that had the $50 million in back order? Um, Can I only foundation that because it had four different companies. It, it was basically a tran transition from the Native Hawaiian veterans. So all the work that I was doing there, a lot of it um, transitioned over to the NHO. 
So we were doing homeland security, emergency management, IT, cyber, uh, command centers, um, UXO, unexplode ordinance, cleanup, environmental work. So basically each company was given a, a piece of the different uh, categories uh, yeah. and then they grew it from there. Okay. Now, when you started though, right, and you retired, how did you know how to do all this stuff? Well, I would have to say the military gave a great foundation. Okay. You know, um, particularly in the area of leadership and organization. Okay. Uh, I think education gave me an application as far as uh, schooling. Um, but the application part, I think, had a lot to do with the, the 33 years in the military of knowing how to lead and particularly knowing how to deal with uh, with people in general, because this is what the business is about. In fact, I had a, a comment made to me when I retired from the Army, uh, what I was going to do. And I said, well, uh, finish up my doctrine. I've been working on it for such a long time. And he said, well, um, whatever you do, right? These three things, if you do this, you will be extremely successful. And I said, okay, sir, um, there's a four star at the time. And you know, I, I was like, okay, well, what's up? And he says, basically, relationships. And I said, okay, I can remember that one. So what's the second one? So he said, relationships. And so I figured out the third one. Uh, so it's particularly in the federal marketplace, relationship is huge. Um, people like to do work with people they know, like, trust. And and from that's how I got my first opportunities, like people that I knew, you know, Went to talk to them and they gave me some opportunities and we grew from there. Wow. Nice. Nice. Did the, you said, I know that you said a friend encouraged you. Was he, did he help you with the business at all? Or he just encouraged you to get started? Um, He just encouraged me to get started. And then of course you need money. So I went to talk to a, a friend of mine who was a um, chairman of a bank. I used to golf with him like every other month. And so he gave me my first line of credit and and then we, we just went from there. But it was interesting because uh, after the first line of credit, he basically uh, said, any, any more lines that you need, Ray, put your house up. And I kind of <laughs> chuckled and I said, you, are you serious? He goes, oh, of course. He says, I, I expect you to have skin in the game. And the bank is not an at-risk organization. So I will help you. But I also need to know that uh, you're in. Did you ever have to do it? Um, yeah, but I had to put my house up after okay. a while because I was asking for more and more. And especially when I started asking for millions of dollars, that was a whole different ball game. Right. And it got to a point where the company was solvent enough where I, I no longer had to collateralize anything other than the company and the contracts that I had. So basically at that point, any of my personal liabilities was removed and it, it was all on the company at that point. Gotcha. Okay. How, do you remember how long it took to get to that point? Because, I mean, was that years? I mean, was that um, five it, years? It took about, yeah, about there, about four to five years before okay. the bank said, okay. And that was a negotiation as well. And they said, okay, you know, we had enough in a, in a company in reserves and we were um, doing well. And at that point, then they were, uh, they removed uh, the liability on, on my house. <laughs> No, I think that's important to know because, right, uh, in entrepreneurship, I think, uh, like you said, I like the guy's comment where it says the bank is not an at risk. What is it? What is it? Not a not at risk. Yeah, organization. So I think a lot of times we go to the banks like, just give me money, right? Yeah. Just give me money, and right, we don't don't expect anything in return, right? We'll pay it back. Just trust me. <laughs> <laughs> is that that's what people you know a lot of small businesses do that they take right. that approach and it doesn't work that way <laughs> <laughs> I, I like that so now you you, you got the bank you, you know you started it uh you went to you did you know relationships 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 the bank you have you started you got some more lines of credit you kept growing the organization what about you know how did you learn how to hire people hr like all those things that come with growing a small business well, part of that was in the, the military as well. Um, since I was a commander, I had at one point 243 federal technicians working uh, within our organization. So uh, we uh, we had an HR division and everything else. So I already had a kind of like a head start of how to manage 
uh, large organizations because of the military. Um, right. And then little by little, um, we we did most of it internal um, and then anything external, um, you know, like HR, um, accounting. And eventually we were able to, as the company grew, to bring that in internally. So okay. basically had a little chip. Um, every time we got to a certain point in the organization's growth, then I add it internally. Um, so I didn't try to you know, jump into everything all one time, just kind of hired a lot of the experts um, and then insourced it after, after a period of time. Okay. All right. I like that. So re- first reached out to the experts and then when you, when you could support it internally, then you brought it into house. Yes. Okay. Is that something that you would recommend for uh, other small businesses, other entrepreneurs coming up? Yeah, don't don't bite more off than you can chew. Um, you know, most small businesses about eighty percent fail, um, so <clears throat> you don't want to be that eighty percent. You want to be that twenty percent. Mm-hmm. So um, be a little prudent in the starting point. Um, hire the right people. Uh, we use the term kinoli, which is our foundation which means uh, that uh, it's a model that means hiring the right person at the right time for the right moment with the right values. So it's not necessarily hiring the best and the brightest and the smartest because they may not uh, fit the culture of your organization. So the best thing to do is to do it the Kinoli way and you know hire the right person at the right time with the right values. Is hire the pr- right person at the right time for the right moment with the right values? For the right reason, uh, with for the right values. Okay, for the right reason. Okay, with the right values. Yeah. Okay. So putting the right person in the right place and also, you know, you have circles and squares with the, the, the circles and the circles and the squares and the squares. Um, I remember one time there was a guy with a P, uh, excuse me, a, a MBA from Harvard. And you know he was like, uh, you know, I'm I I really good. I got an MBA from Harvard, and I was and I was really at that point very skeptic because um, normally at that level they they tended to be an I person, not a we person. And in our organization, we were looking for we um, teammates and not somebody who thought he was better than everybody else. Mm, that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. So tell us more about your military background. I know that you were a commander, but uh, where, where did you start? Um, infantry, you know, just give some people, I mean, a lot of people out here, veterans are listening to these things. So tell us a bit more about your military background, please. Started uh, in the 70s during the Vietnam War. Okay. Um, I decided to enlist versus to be drafted. <laughs> and so that hopefully I could pick my my MOS, because I was enlisted when I first started, um, off to Fort uh, Fort Jackson, South Carolina for basic training. Actually, the first time I ever left the islands was um, to, to in the military. Okay. Um, from there, um, kind of they moved me into an area that I didn't expect, uh, a little, um, it was called uh, Special Operations uh, during the Vietnam War, and then got back um our unit was actually deactivated during that period of time uh it's called max sog and then i they decided uh, in fact my colonel basically told me at that time he says you know you can stay in and we can move you to another special operations group uh, or and he recommended to get out and and go get a degree and get commissioned and then come back and then come back and join us. So most of that I, I took advantage of. I got out. I actually went had four more years of obligation. So I decided to go into National Guard, uh, went off to officers candidate school, got commissioned, and then started going to college. Um, and then decided that I didn't want to go back into that world. So I, I, I stayed in the National Guard for a period of time. And then eventually I went back on active duty where I retired out of, uh, after 33 years. So um, uh, it was really helpful as a, you know, a young kid that uh, a senior officer like that just, uh, saw some interest in me and my abilities that he thought he could see. And then what was even better yet is I, I was smart enough to, to, to listen. Mm-hmm. There you are. Uh, no, I would imagine. 
And so now you're out 33 years. You're like, okay, I'm retired. And what am I going to do? Friend says, all right, go into business. <laughs> yeah. So That's... initially I was going to work uh, for Booz Allen uh, okay. as a crisis, crisis director um, at the uh, user pack in uh, Fort Shafter, Hawaii. Um, but they didn't win the contract. So at that point now, it's like, okay. Uh, so for a short period, for about four to six months, I uh, was working as a senior emergency manager at uh, the post office for Hawaii and Guam, right in the middle of when anthrax hit. So that was kind of exciting. To look oh, at. wow. Anthrax. Uh, kept me busy. Uh-huh. Um, and that's when you know my friend decided, you know, we went to lunch and he's he's quite an entrepreneur. He was like five companies. And um, as he said, look, hey, Ray, I used to block for you in high school. And here I am. And I said, so why don't you start your own business? And he gave me an idea. And so I researched it quite a bit. And right at that time, uh, President Bush passed an executive order 313360 that gave disabled veterans a 3% um, work in the federal marketplace. So I thought that was a perfect entry point to try to get into that program because it was new to help disabled vets, you know, get into federal contracting. Right. So that's kind of the game, the, the, the start point. And what, was it, what was the name of the program? 13360? Yeah, uh, 13360. Mm-hmm. Okay, All right. Interesting. Can you tell us one thing when you first started in business that was hard that still remain hard when you finish the business? I'm not sure I would use the word hard. Okay. I would say the most important is, okay. again, going back to hiring the right person at the right time with the right values. It really makes a difference. I mean, when there's a, it's a team effort and everybody is helping each other to grow your organization, um, by far, I, I think that's the most critical aspect. Of course, having lines of credits is important as you grow your capacity. But as you as you as you're growing, the bank stays with you if you're doing well. You know, um, it's just business in general. Um, but the key to everything to our growth, and we end up being the SBA Business of the Year, um, Disabled Veteran Business of the Year, 8A Graduate of the Year, and I, I always go back to the point that it, it was the people in the organization that made it uh, possible for all that to happen. Yeah, uh, I noticed you've been awarded uh, Native Hawaiian Chamber of Commerce Award, Pacific Business Veteran Business Award, Pacific News and Fastest 50 Award, Top Engine, mm-hmm. Environment Engineering Firm in Hawaii, Hawaii Business Top 250 Businesses, Number One Native Hawaiian Owned Company. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. you've achieved a lot of awards. Yeah, um, again, you know, having the right people with the right values as a team uh, made it all possible. Mm-hmm. Did you? When you were selecting your team members, were there any strategies that you used that you think maybe helped separate you from other organizations? Did you know, did you pull them from temp agencies? Did you post online? Like, you know, what kind of things did you do that you thought maybe to help you attract some of those key members that you needed? Well, initially, because we were small, word of mouth. Uh, okay. Relationships, 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 right? And if someone gives you a contact that says this person is really good, that means that person is putting up his own per- his own credibility on the line. Right. Um, so chances are you're, you're going to be in the right direction. And I think only once um, it went wrong and that person was really, uh, he was apologizing up and down. So sorry. He always thought this guy was really good, but I mean, it does happen, but. But, uh, you know, that 90% rate of success, I take that all the time. Um, and then eventually you had to go into where you got bigger and bigger. And we got to a point where we're about 400, 450 employees. That's a whole, and, you know, all over the globe. That that word of mouth is um, not capable to, to handle the growth at that time. So you go through a regular process, HR, interviewing. And and we used again that that criteria was very important again Ken Oli trying to find that right person with the right values um, to ensure success not only for the individual but for the organization as well. 
are there any when you when you again when you're first getting started uh, a co- question that a lot of small businesses ask me is well how did you start without past performance how we got off the ground um is we went after subcontracting opportunities okay uh, a lot of people they want to jump in and be a prime right out of the gate and that's really really difficult uh when you don't have past performance so because of relationships, we were able to team up with uh, other friends and their organizations, and then they gave us a small piece of the pie. And and then we were able to grow past performance and go in to talk to more contracting people and, and military organizations and continue to grow capacity from that point. But I always thought the, the real critical part was to do subcontracting um, we did have a, a prime contract as with with no past performance, but that was based on experience, and uh, they wanted our experience. But um, so they gave us a contract, and and because it was a disabled veteran company at that time, we were the, I think one of the first to get a set aside sole sourcing disabled veteran contract, and it was all based on we knew the customer, we knew what they wanted. They, they, they knew what our abilities was, so they, they really wanted it. Uh, and past performance was then basically based on our experiences. But I would say majority of the time, um, you have to build past performance, and then you can grow capacity at that point. Are there any projects that you could think of that were really notable that essentially helped your company right go from where you said, you know what, I think we're making it to the big, you know, when, we're, when you're approaching... Uh, I know when we're starting out, you get you get those smaller contracts. Were there any notable projects where maybe you onboarded 50 people, 20, you know, 25 people, 100 people that you can remember that you said, okay, now this is where we're crossing over from small business to maybe a mid-tier company? Yeah, well, we, we grew to a point where we're no longer a small business. Um, right. And what was really helpful, too, we had a mentor protege program okay. with Battelle Institute. And they they provided us a lot of the back office growth that we did not have. So we basically took what they gave us and applied it to our programs, so our accounting systems, HR systems. Um, and then, of course, they gave us work, um, subcontracting work. And uh, because of that, too, we were able to bid on a contract with the Navy, their command center. And that was a... 10 locations, five overseas and five CONUS. And that was a huge contract. And that was our first real big one, you might say. And all that support from Patel that helped us get off the ground uh, really gave us that ability to go do that. And you said it's called Patel Institute? Yes. Yeah, they're, they're at that point maybe about a $3 billion annual revenue company. So pretty large. Mm-hmm. Okay. I see it. T-T-E-L-E. All right. I know this is going to seem redundant. H- how did you get, how did you get Battelle Institute to get, do a minute project with you? Well, I started looking for different companies to kind of help us because I, I knew of the uh, mentor protege programs. And so there were one of 10 that I, I came down to. And actually, the first company that, that reached out was actually Raytheon. Um, but we were already kind of looking at Patel because I, I liked, they were a nonprofit organization. So there was a lot of similarities uh, versus not just about making money, but making a difference. Right. So I went to visit them and uh, met with their CEO and their staff and everything else. And uh, after about two hours when I was leaving, it was interesting. I guess one of their key people in had quietly, they thought he's quietly said, I don't think they're hungry enough. Mm. And so I turned around um, being a good infantry officer um, said, uh, well, maybe you're not the right team for me because I selected you, not you select me. And, mm-hmm. and the CEO um, at that point it said, uh, please write. Um, you are the right. We are the right team. We have the right values. And he looked at that guy, and the guy just his head went down. 
And um, I said, yeah, okay, sir. So, um, and I walked out and then we, after that, um, we were in, in fact, we were the only company Mattel ever put into strategic planning um, by name. And that was, that was really huge because every time we walked into one of their different offices and divisions, they knew us immediately because they go, oh, Native Hawaiian veterans. Yeah, you know, the, the, uh, we see you under the strategic planning and they all would say the same thing. Mattel has never put a company's name, a small business in their strategic planning. So it, that was a huge uh, kickstart for us. Wow. I like that. That's amazing. And like you said, they gave you HR, accounting, some yeah, back office support. Um, yeah. Um, uh, program management, uh, project okay. management. So a lot of their back office capacities, they they shared it with us. Okay. Do you remember at that time how many employees you had? We weren't that large yet. I, I would say we're lucky we were 30 employees at the time when we started the Mentor Protégé. Okay. Um, they, again, they wanted our relationships. Right. And we wanted their um, depth, right? Uh, they had a lot of depth, and we had a lot of people that we knew. Okay. Wow. I'm taking a lot of notes here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope everyone listening to this is enjoying this conversation. I am. Because a lot, you know, people ask that question all the time uh, about how do you find, you know, mentors? Right. For proteges, a lot of organizations are constantly send me, Eric, how do I find a mentor? How do I find a mentor? And uh, what what would you what kind of advice would you provide to small business looking for mentors? Um, it's a marriage. Um, so like all marriages, uh, you have to work at it. And if not, it falls apart. Um, so a lot of time into proteges don't work out well. Um, so I always say is have that relationship with the leadership at the top. So I looked at it, you know, I'm a CEO. Uh, he's the CEO. He's just, they just have a lot more revenue than me, but we're basically CEO. So I start from there. Um, so if the CEO is bought in, then the, everybody else is bought in as well. But if you're at the, you know, if you're working at the lower levels, then you're just normally a tool for them for their progression. It's not the same unless you have a relationship with them. Right. Uh, but if you build that relationship with the leadership, then everybody kind of falls in line at that point. Um, so you don't have that uh, drama of the, trying to move up the chain because they're kind of up that chain already. And it's really about their relationship with you, um, what you bring to the table, uh, and then and then you go from there. And it's not always, you know, worked out. Um, Sometimes there's some um, issues along the way right. And, right. and and you have to learn how to work it out. Mm -hmm. Right. Fair. How did you learn about government contracting? I know you came from the military background, but I do not make the assumption that people, everyone in military understands federal procurement. Is it, yes, is that, you understand the question? Not. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's because I was, you know, at the um, command level, right? Um, so we would um, have requirements like you know build a, a new building or or get something that is that the government don't have. So we would you know go out of you know the government is the largest um, buyer in the world, um, and DoD is the largest of those buyers. So you you learn that when you want something, some of it becomes uh, uh, outsourcing, and you you go and contract it, and it's a contracting agency. So got to learn and understand that a little um, because my job was is I just asked for what I want and then people go figure out how to get it. Right. Uh, so my job is actually the easiest one because I just have to come up with ideas of growing the organization and everybody else has to go chase around trying to figure out how to make it happen. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, that, I like that perspective on things. A couple kind of outside of the government contracting realm, you were telling me, I know we were having a hard time getting on your calendar. And uh, wh where are you currently? What state are you living in today? Well, I'm, I'm back in San Antonio. And then okay. next week, I head to Honolulu. Mm -hmm. All right. Nice. So do you get to Honolulu much or do you get to Hawaii much? Back yes, because the... I live. I go both. I live. I have two places, one there in Honolulu and here in San Antonio. Okay. And heading back to Honolulu because uh, about 14 years ago, we're one of the founders of the Nakoa Wounded Warrior Regatta, 
And uh, that's coming up in August. And so I'm heading back there for that. And then uh, that's grown um, to, we have, uh, it's an international event now. We have teams from Australia and from England. And um, we were supposed to have a team from Canada and Ukraine, but the Ukraine one got a little um, difficult uh, as uh, under the circumstances. So they weren't able to, to come in this year. So hopefully they, they come in next year and, and we'll, we'll play that up quite a bit and market that piece about the Ukrainians have their own Wounded Warrior Regatta um, team uh, coming to participate in Hawaii. Wow, that's amazing. And how long have you been doing that? 14 years now. Uh, uh, we took a little hiatus because of COVID uh, for about two years. And then uh, last year, we brought it back again. Wow, amazing. So you're a busy guy. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to slow down a, a little. <laughs> Uh -huh. um, no longer involved in operations, uh, okay. but uh, do a lot of nonprofit work now. <laughs> okay. Any other nonprofit work you want to share that you work that you do? Well, we were uh, one of the things we did for veterans, particularly. Um, uh, we had a veterans entrepreneur training seminar called Vets. Good little acronym there. And uh, I did that in uh, in San Antonio, in D.C., Hawaii, Guam. And we started um, going around and helping veterans and disabled veterans how to start, grow, and sustain a business. We also did that for, we called it an empowerment program, and we did that for minorities as well. Uh, and, you know, we had, the, we had a lot of successes as Native Hawaiian veterans, and, and um, so we were sharing that, um, helping other people uh, who were interested in, you know, getting into um, becoming an entrepreneur and, um, and helping them navigate that, not only in the federal marketplace, but also in the commercial world. Okay. Okay. All right. No, that's exciting. When you were in business, were there any quotes or sayings, maybe it comes from the military, uh, maybe it comes from, right, uh, a family member, anything that like, you know, they say follow your mission, right, for the organization. Was there anything that that people say, you know, every time I talk to Ray, he would always tell me this. He would always say this, right? Yeah. When I would teach, um, um, the first thing when uh, everybody came in and they sat down, I would tell them, that says, you are here to learn. But when you leave, you leave to serve. And I made them say that so that it wasn't just about making money. It was about making a difference. So that was my first one right out of the gate I would give them as they walked in the door. Um, and then along the way, I told them one of the biggest thing in business, um, and I made them say that three times, cash is king. <laughs> uh, because you run out of cash, um, you go to this thing called chapter 11. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so always pay attention to your cash flow, because sometimes you can get ahead of yourself. And, and when you do that, um, you get yourself in a lot of trouble because you can't maintain growth without maintaining your cash flow appropriately. And then another one I would also use is called you give, you get. You get, you give. So the purpose of that was you, know, you don't take, you kind of give first, uh, and then you get it, and then you give back, and then you get more. Um, so People started um, embracing that approach, uh, and that's again, that's all about you know making a difference. If you make a difference, more people know who you are. They like you. They want to do work with you. Say it again. You give. You get. You, you give. You get. You get. You, you give. give. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's about making a difference. Yeah, and you know that goes with our foundation too, right? We give. We give. We help uh, from the business side. We would make money. And then I would put money to the foundation and then the foundation would give back to the community. Then I go back to the government that says, look what we've done, you know, not only for you, but for the community. And um, if it wasn't for you guys giving us work, we wouldn't be able to make a difference in our community. And I let the community know if, if it wasn't for the military, I wouldn't be able to give money to the community. So it, it worked out really well. I like that. That's very insightful. Mm -hmm. Where do you where do you come up with all this stuff from? I am not sure. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that's fair. That's a fair one. Yeah, you know, I, maybe I like to say it's it's um, our Hawaiian culture. 
It's about giving. Um, in fact, maybe at one point, Hawaiian culture gave too much and um, mm-hmm. and uh, put us in, in jeopardy in other areas. But it's just it's, it's a cultural thing, too, that it's always about helping others and not just about taking. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of times, that's why I ask these questions, because it helps you to understand the guiding philosophies and principles by which you operate, right? And the way you led the organization. And that's, to me, that's important to understanding what, who the leader is and, um, and, you know, what the leader stands for. So thank you for that. What, let's talk about, uh, we're going to change course real quick, something different. Any books that you recommend or books that you've read that you've shared with people? There's one book, um, uh, Good to Great. Okay. You like Good to Great? Uh, yeah, and I like that one. Um, it is s- similar to our philosophy. Um, as he put it, put, puts the right people on the bus. That's his approach to everything. And oh. um, so there's a, I would highly recommend that book. Um, it's just a good way. Uh, it, it really approaches the area of how to bring on people, right? Because people are the ones that grows your organization. And then and his approach was, you know, put them on the right people on the bus and then go figure out where they fit at that point. So very similar to our Ken Oli Foundation uh, and our Ken Oli model. Mm-hmm. Tell me a recent purchase that you've made off Amazon that has brought you joy. Um, and, um, actually, that's my wife. <laughs> she does, <laughs> she's the Amazon person. Right? All right. That's your wife, Amazon yeah, person. And, and I did something. And I then I I have a, like a little joke about it. I go, you know, the UPS man uh, came to the house one day and knocked on the door, and he says, um, "Oh, there was there was no um, Amazon purchases today. Is, is everything okay?" <laughs> so, I so like she that. Does, she likes her. Uh, I knew we get a lot of. It's just a lot easier right on Amazon. Right. She right. does a lot of that. Right. 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 No, I agree. Can you tell us about an odd place or job that you've worked at that maybe no one's ever guessed? Well, I guess my first job was a dishwasher um, uh, when I was in high school. And then during the summertime, I would go work with my dad. He was a roofer. And that that was a um, real hard job. <laughs> and he kept um, pounding into me that this is not the kind of job that um, you would want to be. You got to work really hard. You're in the sun. Um, and, you know, could do something else. Uh, but part of that, he, he wanted me to learn, you know, about working hard. So right. those are kind of the, you know, the two jobs initially when I first, and, and then, of course, I joined the military, you know, when I was 18 and then, you know, went from there. If you were not, if you didn't start that business, and I know you said you worked for Booz Allen, do you, do you have any idea of what else you might be doing? Probably look. Well, I probably would have stayed with the, the post office you know, as their emergency manager, you know, because it was a federal job. So I could have what we call double dip, right? Get my military retirement and then get a federal retirement on top of that. But yeah, I mean, you never know uh, destiny and the right place at the right time, talking to, to a friend of mine. And next thing you know, he put that bug in my ear and I said, oh, let me go give this a shot. Mm-hmm. I like it. And it wasn't all you know, um, roses, because we did have one bad year. I mean, that's, I want to let people know that, that don't okay. expect it's up, up and away and everything's all going to be wonderful. But we got to a point where we got ourselves into a little trouble financially. And that's why I keep saying cash is king. And uh, the, um, that, that we had to go figure out a way how to get out of the hole and get back into the black. And, even the bank was kind of surprised. I actually did not fire anybody. They didn't take anybody to reduce their pay. The only people that took a pay cut was the executives, uh, the president, I mean, the CEO, which was me, uh, my my vice, uh, my C- COO and CFO. We all took pay cuts um, to uh, try to get back into the black and I put that out in our newsletter, um, letting people know that nobody was going to be losing their job that the leadership was going to take the hit um, because we created the hit. Uh, so we were, we were going to figure out a way internally. And then amazing enough, 13, 13 months later, because we kept getting new contracts, 
as well, we were able to pull ourselves out of the red and then get ourselves back into the black. Nice. Nice. How did you, what were your thoughts and your feelings during that time frame? Like what was it, what was going through your mind? Um, well, not a happy camper, obviously. <laughs> um, you know, because uh, things weren't, you know, of course you want everything to go, you know, really well, but reality and life things um, don't. And it's, I uh, think, uh, you know, it's how to get off the ground and, and figure out and how to figure out the way ahead. And that was, I mean, there was other approaches that we could have taken um, to get back into the black. But three of the four of us actually had retired from the military. And and um, so we had income coming in. Right. Um, so where everybody else was pretty much, that was their job. That's it. Right. So we could actually take a pay cut. And yeah, it still hurts, but we still you know, we still have income coming in as well, and it it really got the leadership really squared away in the future that we paid a lot more attention to everything uh, after we had that dip. Mm. Mm. So it turned out to be a good thing at the end. It worked out. I mean, fortunately, it worked out. But it really, again, like I said, it it did get everybody's attention, particularly in the leadership roles that don't take things for granted. And and I that was another term I use on, uh, with our when we would have our meetings is that uh, you're not growing you're dying and so um, but then again you got to be cautious on your growth right uh, you, right you grow too fast and then you have a cash problem mm -hmm. right right well Ray what what other things for small businesses listening uh, or veterans listening out here. Um, you know, what type of words would you like to leave them with about, you know, your story, their story? Can you share some words for, for veterans out here listening to this and other small businesses? Well, I think the, again, I go back to make sure, you know, the Kinoli approach, which is hiring the right person at the right time with the right values. That really, to me, is what made our organization so successful. Um, um, we knew people, they knew us. Um, and we were out there and just the right people at the right time really made a difference. Um, um, you don't know it all, especially the boss. I mean, you have to embrace uh, your your staff and have meetings where they have the ability to speak their minds. Now, even in the military, it's the same thing. I, you know, all my staff, all my battalion commanders, everybody had a say. Um, so they felt they were part of the organization, um, but I had the final say because I'm, I'm I'm the guy at the hot seat. So, but I listened, right? Um, so you're informed on making good decisions at that point. So I lead with people. Uh, that's that's probably a critical element, um, and then the ability to listen and then make a decision and not think you know it all. I like that. I like that. And. So again, I know that you're traveling a lot and it was hard to get you in our schedule. <laughs> Tell us, what, is, what are some of the places you got coming up this year? I know you sent me a long itinerary of places. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, next week we go to Honolulu um, and then, you know, for our, our nonprofit uh, uh, regatta. And then uh, we come back to San Antonio for a day or two to unpack and repack. And we're off to Montreal uh, uh, on a cruise, uh, seaborne around the Great Lakes, um, all the way up through Maine and down to New York, and then go see some friends in New York at the same time. Uh -huh. And so September, then October, uh, we're in D.C. Okay. I have, uh, I have a good friend of mine, uh, Glenn Del, Del Toro, uh, Del Gardo, actually retiring from NASA. He's a small business guy at NASA. So okay. he sent me an email, asked me if I would come up for his retirement. So I said, you nope. know, I got, I got a lot of free time on my health. I can do that. <laughs> so, so going up there, um, again, see more friends, um, enjoy his retirement with him. And then uh, we'll, we'll, in November, we're off to Munich, Germany, uh, where I uh, advise for a for-profit company. Okay. And um, so they're having their annual uh, end of the year in, in Germany, which um, and last year they had it in Australia. So that's that's one of the bennies of being a, uh, an advisor at times. 
Nice, nice. That's interesting. So you, now you're advising other organizations out of the country. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Well, Ray, I, I really uh, I appreciate your time. I know your time is valuable. I know it's important. Uh, I do appreciate all the things that you've shared with us today. I really, like I said, I was when I met you in Hawaii and they said, this is the guy you got to meet. This is, <laughs> you know, they said that you are like the godfather of the NHL program. And I said, OK, I got to talk to Ray. Yeah. Um, and so I really appreciate you spending some time with us. Um, any parting words for everyone out here listening? No, I kind of hope everybody um, well. I mean, it's a getting to business is um, it's a leadership skill as well. Um, be advised that a lot of companies don't make it. So when you do go in there, I think the one of the more critical things to start off is a business plan because you put your thoughts on a piece of paper that is formatted. For business, it talks about the different uh, requirements that you would do. And and the banks won't even talk to you without a business plan because they want to know that you thought this through and uh, the chances are better than not that you're going to be successful. Right. So the leading word, the, the parting words would be um, put together a business plan, put your thoughts together, look at it, and then that's your roadmap for your future. Thank you, Ray, so much for coming on today. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you. Take care. You too.